Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to The Four Muslims, the realest podcast in the dunya. Make sure you smash that like button. I've never said that before, bro. Make sure you smash that like button, rate, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> How are we doing, boys? Wa alaikum assalam, bro. How you been? How you been? I'm doing really well, thank you. What about you, bro? Listen, I'll give you five stars for that intro and for your YouTube channel. Mashallah, the algorithm is going to work with your channel. All right, well, thank you. Real quick, how did you find our channel, bro? Through Angel. He made the um, I'm a Muslim now video about a year ago. And then he also mentioned that he was doing the podcast with you guys. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, okay. Alhamdulillah, man. Last time we spoke, there were a few things that you said you had on your mind, like questions that you wanted to ask us, right? But before mm. we jump right in, Tell us a little bit about your journey, bro. For anyone that doesn't know what self-improvement or Kaizen or anything like that is, tell us about your journey, bro. Okay. So I was born in Pakistan and we moved to the UK when I was a few years old and I was raised as a Muslim. I was, uh, we used to go to the mosque as well. And my mom taught me the Sapara and I always like fought against it. I didn't want to read it. I didn't really understand it. And as I got older and older, I kind of took a big step back away and I, I saw uh, science and um, went a lot more like Western and degenerate and found the red pill and casual sex and drugs. Then self-improvement really began for me in 2020. I took a step back from that life. I, I essentially, I achieved the lifestyle that the... Um, the hedonism pushed me towards i achieved everything that i thought i really wanted I, I slept with many girls i took many drugs went to parties did everything and i hated my life after doing that for like two years so I moved back um took a step back away from everything everyone moved back home to my family's house no friends no girlfriend no nothing and i literally just started meditating and reading books and posting my learning lessons of my developments online and then those videos just kind of popped off so i talk about the conventional things you see in a young man self-improvement so building strength going to the gym discipline no fap um i try to speak more and more about healthy relationships although that's definitely an area that i need to learn more about myself as well Got you, got you. Alhamdulillah. I was just changing the the thing to a uh, slow mo, bro, because people are spamming the comments. Alhamdulillah. But all that being aside, when you mentioned that it led you to, um, or you've mentioned in a few videos at least that you know you've changed your views a couple times. There's this one video where you you even you know verbatim you said that you know I'm admitting that you know all of the things that I've I've learned, some of them might not be correct, at least in terms of the red pill. And I want to be the first one to say for myself, and I know for the other two brothers here, that we used to follow the red pill too, to a certain extent, right? There's elements of truth in everything, right? There's elements of truth in red pill. There's elements of truth in a lot of ideologies, right? But it doesn't make it objectively true, right? We're going to get into what objective truth even means for a lot of the viewers that don't know. But before we go on, Anha, Rami, bro, anything on your minds? I have a random question, bro. When you say when you say that you found science, what did that mean? How did that change your perspective mm -hmm. on this? I guess because of my upbringing with my family, I was taught about Islam and Allah, and then going through the education system, and you start um, learning about science and the Big Bang. And yeah. that's also when, like, the kids around me would also say, like, oh, you know, like, religion, God's not real and everything. And, of course, like, I totally believe it. Like, even still to this day, it's, like, it's one of those where I've I've had that mindset for so long that it feels so normal for me to not consider any kind of higher power. Wow. Wow. Bro. Wow. SubhanAllah. Wow. Yo, wait till Rami tells you about, you know, some of how literally science essentially came from Muslims. The majority of the modern science that we have today came from Muslims, bro. But the Western education system, along with a lot of things like, you know, feminism and all this, they're going to throw a lot of these things that don't make sense, bro. Just to throw yeah. us off our square. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that eventually. Uh, it is a big topic. So, uh, uh, Anhel, bro, how about you? No, let's just dive in, bro. I'm excited. Right. All right, Bismillah. Let's get into it. All right. So the first thing that I wanted to genuinely ask you, bro, living in this this red pill, I guess, 
centric world where you were saying that you were living a hedonic life, right? You would you were following the things that, that most you know people were following YouTubers. You made that video saying that red pill YouTubers, and you you kind of exposed them, right? Tell us a little bit about that because we've been speaking about that on our channel for a while. That there are truths in red pill being red pill aware and stuff like that, but essentially we see it lead to a road where it just leads to no morality anymore. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, they understand female nature. Yes, there's evolutionary psychology and behaviorism, right? No one's denying that, but there's no morality. There's no conscience. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So tell us a little bit about that video they made. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the truths of the red pill only seem like jaw-dropping because we've adopted such like backwards blue pill thinking that men and women are the same. And so the truth really is just oh yeah men and women are different and so of course women are attracted to different things and a lot of it's just based on like the biological differences between men and women and so there's like th there's certain facts which i really found uh, very interesting like women will prefer men who show more dominant and alpha characteristics of higher testosterone when they're ovulate ovulating when they're able to get pregnant and that's mm -hmm. like, kind of something that you're not really taught about here because you're thought you know be nice be yourself but there's like, biological proof that there is really that tendency of like al alpha fucks. Can I can I swear on here? Or is that okay? <laughs> it's, it's, it's better if you don't. We'll, we'll edit that. Okay, out. my apologies. No, alpha no. F and then beta bucks. But um, so there is there is beautiful truth to it, and it's, it, I think it's very important that young men get that knowledge because you don't hear it in the in like Western societies. At least mm -hmm. I've only ever grown up in the West. So I'm not too sure in different countries, but we hear that men and women are the same. We should be treated equally, and whilst there is like some need of equality. You can certainly go like too far with that to the point that now boys think that they should behave like girls and girls think that they should behave like boys. And now mm. we're all just dead inside because of that, that lack of polarity. So mm. the issue then with the red pill, because so far it sounds great, but the issue then is that you've, you've got to kind of understand like the red pill is more just kind of like the belief system, but the biggest influences of the red pill are degenerates. They're the type of guys who already had a messed up self-image that they found that knowledge, they implemented it for the fastest version of intimacy that they could get, which is casual sex. And then they're also the guys who had the level of self-image that was already broken to then post about it online and tell other guys, here's how you can hook up with girls from the club. Mm -hmm. And so by following the red pill, a young man is naturally going to come across those challenge channels where he learns directly from a guy whose main goal was pleasure and the guys lie about it and they say like no you know the main goal should be purpose and everything beyond your purpose but the truth is like the entire channel is focused on casual sex and so at least for me like i take responsibility that that became my biggest goal and the idea is oh you know like i'm on my purpose i'm going to the gym and everything mm. but it's all fueled by the desire of casual sex because you grow up as like a little loner directionless purposeless and then here's finally you know and you've tried you've been on tinder and you've been messaging girls and nothing's happening and mm. here's finally like the truth the guys are saying oh yeah well you know you here's how you can get the number clothes here's how you can get the lay clothes here's how you can go to the club and like sleep with the first girl that you see well just mm. follow these easy tactics one i think the biggest criticism i have which i mentioned in that video it's titled uh red pill youtubers are traumatized that by following these kind of degenerate, cold-hearted tactics, so some of them are like, you know, don't message her back, treat her bad in a sense, you're just automatically going to filter out all of the good women who actually have any kind of respect for themselves. All that's left is like those club thoughts. They're yeah. the type of girls who are going to be more attracted to a guy who, for example, doesn't message them back. And that's like, that's got to be saying something. If the girl is more attracted to you because you're not speaking to her, like that's really messed up hmm. and so at least that's like that's the the hole that i found myself in man subhanallah bro first thing i wanted to say is the thing you were talking about men and women having polarity and women having different mate preferences in different times of the month and if they're on you know birth control and all that we literally dropped a video yesterday about that subhanallah and that's the thing bro like islam like has been saying these things from jump street from day one we're not shy about these things but the thing with red pill feminism to a certain extent all of these isms is they're they're creating 
man-made constructs because they don't have divine revelation and you can do that and you can be right you know sometimes but you can also be wrong sometimes right second thing i want to say is i want to give you some praise bro mashallah for your, your hamza and for the hamza unfiltered channel you were dropping some stuff there that when you're basically projecting this red pill ideology and you're taking things that these youtubers you know so-called are, are putting things as literally like matter of fact you're only going to attract that type of woman right you 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 leave a girl on scene and she gets hooked to that well then you're basically going to get a damaged woman that's into that right so you know you saying these things a lot of youtubers aren't right a lot of youtubers i see in the red pill sphere are hypocrites bro and i'm i'm not here you know attacking any youtubers right now you do your thing but how are you going to make a video about nofap and semen retention but then your clickbaity thumbnail is literally going to cause someone to go watch you know what i mean like i've seen so many of youtubers do that and I don't see that with you and, and, and a few other YouTubers too. Alhamdulillah. Mm. If you're talking about semen retention or nofap, it literally stays with that. You're not going to trap someone or bait someone into staying in this cycle where they need the YouTuber now. You know what I mean? So that's first and foremost. Um, mm. The second thing I wanted to touch on was when you said that it leads to a place where you're following people that are hurt or traumatized or they're literally arguing with thoughts. Bro, I agree. I'm not going to make I'm not going to name the, the, the channel by name right now, but there's so many channels that are literally arguing with thoughts about women and they're leading a life where they're telling you to treat women and only attract women and, and create the type of woman that they're claiming to, to say that we should avoid. Do you get what I mean? Like you're, mm. you're every time you're, you're having casual sex or every time you're, you're like, okay, there's, there's a, a side chick, but there's a main chick. Bro, every time you're with that side chick, you're literally creating another thought. You're creating another issue. Of what you're talking about you know what i mean mm. but there is a huge problem with integrity in that circle and that's what made me feel only when i had the level of accountability of posting uh the stuff i was doing and then my boys were calling me out for it otherwise i would have never really thought about it but you've got to lack integrity by posting red pill content and by engaging in that life because the, the argument is, okay, you know, women are so bad, like women are evil in the dating market. And there's there's so many like ultra sexual women who um, are like manipulative. They're all thoughts. And the channel that you're mentioning, of course, we all know which one it is. And that makes sense. Okay, fair enough. If you're going to be living like a faithful man who's married and who never like in, engages in the behavior that causes that, otherwise you are part of the problem. And I realize, yeah, 100% I'm part of the problem. I'm, I'm, preaching against this i'm talking about the the detriments of this lifestyle and i'm causing more of those girls to become like that and mm -hmm. it was only the accountability of my followers who saw those videos called me out for it criticized me for it and obviously like it hurt my ego they're they're definitely wrong i'm right i'm the one who's getting laid here that eventually like, i started to think okay people i respect are saying this to me now like i've got to take it seriously it's not the right path mm. okay yeah Last week or two weeks ago, we reacted to a video that you made to Muslim women in the jacuzzi, bro. And what you were saying, I just want to touch on this right now before we go on, is facts, bro. Especially as someone that I don't, you don't consider yourself a Muslim yet, right? Alhamdulillah, bro. But being a non-Muslim per se and, and just being someone that isn't on Dean, you saying the things that Dean basically means like our faith. You know, and Rami can correct me if I'm wrong, but being on Dean means you're on the right path, on the straight path, right? It's just the same. Um, you're practicing. It, it yeah, means you're, practicing. you're actually practicing. Like, that's your way of life. Everyone has a Dean, you know, mm -hmm. like self improvement is a Dean. But in Islam, like, the Dean is like you're, you're practicing, like, you're actively practicing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. But basically, you're, you're not on Dean in terms of, you know, practicing Islam, but you, you have that core fundamental, you know, understanding of, you know, modesty and hijab, right? Now, in the video, you did say, like, imagine how, like, badass it is that a woman respects you so much that she only wants to reveal her skin to you. Yes, that is one tenet of it. But the main reason that, you know, we, as both men and women, bro, we have modesty, right? In Islam, we have to cover up certain parts of our body that are different among men and women <clears throat> but we both have that right and we do this first and foremost for allah because we have haya we have modesty in 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 terms of like shyness you know what i mean to some extent like we don't want to over show 
and we have to abide by that at all times, especially in public. And women that are single as well have to abide by that, right? So I just want to make that that one thing clear. If, <clears throat> if some people are are taking what you said and they're like, oh yeah, it's good. I understand, bro. It's good for for your man, hundred percent. But single women, single Muslim women have to abide by that too, and single Muslim men definitely have to abide by that too. So it's 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 like a bonus in a way when you you're doing that and you're you know only your spouse can see you. But it's something that all Muslims have to do, bro. But that aside, bro, what is your idea or your definition of masculinity because i want to ask you that and i want to basically get a clear understanding of all the ups and downs you've been through and and how you currently at this moment in time see masculinity mm, that's a good question <clears throat> so my my thought process and my answer for this changes quite regularly depending on which book or which author I've been recently reading. And if you asked me this question a couple of years ago, I would, I would have thought, oh, masculinity is about being a man. And I wouldn't really have had any real answer after that. I still don't feel like I, my mind is made up at all. But in my mind, I see the vision of what seems like an old school man, an old school relationship where the man takes responsibility, he's the leader, mm. he is the provider. I see a group of men in like this sense of com camaraderie, brotherhood, growing together, but there's also like a level of, of growth, like criticism with each other, but like friendly with, with through love, mm. I think. I really love the quote from Jack Donovan, the way of men is the way of the gang. And I think mm. a lot of masculinity is based on the brothers that you have around you. Okay. What's your uh, def like definition or vision of masculinity now? My, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you mine and then Anhal and, and Rami can jump in. But in Islam, we have the Quran, right? We believe the Quran. A lot of people think it's just a book. Yes, it's on you know paper, but the Quran is just the word of Allah the word of God. And when God has sent us divine revelation, we'll talk about different religions in a bit too, but I don't want to get into a side tangent, but he sent down the message, right? It got altered in all religions, most religions, but he promised that in, in the Quran, he would preserve it, right? In the Quran, very clearly tells us the rights and responsibilities of men and women, right? This is a huge point. And we have the prophet, peace be upon him, prophet Muhammad, that has taught us that too, right? Now, prophetic and divine revelation of masculinity essentially has roles and responsibilities and also rights, right? And that's different than women. So when people, a lot of people think for some reason that the prophet, peace be upon him, was a feminist because he gave women rights. No, he gave women rights because women and men deserve rights. But the, in Islam, we don't give women rights at the expense of men like feminism does. Mm. And we don't give men rights and value and pleasure at the expense of women like a lot of red pill coaches are preaching, right? So in Islam, the rights and responsibility for roles, a masculine man, right, who, who's in touch with his fitra, right? I want to touch on the fitra point too because a lot of people don't know what that means. I'm sure you don't either, right? No. The fitra is basically our innate, I guess, predisposition right? Every single human being was born with a correct and sound fitra, right? We, you know how you were saying a, a couple minutes ago that like, for some reason, you couldn't just shake off that belief in God, that belief in one God, like that one higher power. That's your fitra, bro. Everyone's born with that fitra. Everyone's born a Muslim, you know? It's just society and parents and all that that changes us. But anyway, the point is, the fitra of a masculine man is one who protects, right? Protects at, at the expense and cost of his own life, puts his own life on the line for his loved ones, provides, right? So provisioning. And this is this is very different than a lot of red pill coaches because they're gonna say, you know, beta bucks, you know, you can't you can't be that beta mill provider. Listen, being a beta mill provider is just being a provider to a thought that hasn't earned anything. Being a provider to your wife and to your kids is a different thing, bro. It's a different ballgame, mm -hmm. right? But if only these people, these spurgs knew. But that's that's one thing. Being a man in terms of being the leader, right? I'm the leader of the relationship, the marriage. You know, I, I decide this is left and this is right by divine revelation, not just something I pull out of thin air. And I'm going to do my best to keep the family on this course, on this track, right? These are the things that make a man a man. This is masculinity. 
And first and foremost, keeping the covenant you have with Allah, keeping the relationship you have with Allah first and foremost. Nothing else compromises that. It's not going to be a job. It's not going to be a woman. It's not going to be anything. But this is how I would describe it. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful, bro, is that uh, number one, it's never changing. It always remains the same. And then number two, mm -hmm. any man who actually looks at this and like really just reflects on this, like it, it aligns. It aligns with something that they can't even explain. And that's, that thing that they can't explain is exactly what Fayyad said. It's a fitra. It's a thing inside of us. So it's like, this is masculinity. This is the masculine role. And then when the feminine role is spoken about in the Quran, that also aligns with women. If they can just stop and reflect on it, if you don't have a feminist. It sounds really, um, really good. Like it, I can see that that must have been so beneficial for you guys to have like a, a huge level of certainty with that because like you with my answer for this question it's like it's based on some like random author from this book it's based on like some random blog it sounds so much nicer to have such a certain thing that you guys have been following yeah well it's that's that's the case i think a lot of the time when it comes to religion in different aspects when it comes to morality when it comes to belief when it comes when it comes to purpose you can't say any any of these things are objective without religion without god like, how can you, you know, how can you prove uh, giving charity is good? You can't prove it. You can only kind of argue for it. Like, oh, it helps them. Why is it good to help people? You know, it's a long line. And same thing with, mora uh, with morality and masculinity. Because masculinity is not one of those things that you type in, you know, Google what's masculinity. And it gives you exactly what it is. It's so encompassing. It's like everything a man should be. It's like, well, what is everything a man should be? Well, it's this, it's this. And it's a long, it ends up being a long list. So you, you're going to have people that disagree. Like, I think a man should provide. And it's like, no, I think a man should you know, be able to provide, but blah, blah, blah. And people come up with all their different answers. When it comes to religion, as uh, the brothers were saying, we have our fitrah. We have exactly how God created us to be and exactly how God created us to act. And within this, we see very beautiful hadith. And this is for all people, not just men, but like the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who I'll get to in a minute, inshallah, where he said that the strong believer is better and more beloved to God than the weak one. But there's good in everyone. How beautiful is that? He says there's good in everyone, right? Everyone has good in them. But the strong person is better than the weak person and more beloved to God. Why? Because they can do more. They can do more. And not just, it's not just physically. It could be financially. It could be mentally. It could be intellectually. It could be in many, many different ways. You know, a strong public speaker is better than someone who is not a strong public speaker. And there was a time when I, you know, I'm not going to say I'm a great public speaker, but there was a time when I was too shy to even sit in front of three people and speak. Um, and now, alhamdulillah, I'm in front of uh, everyone here. But um, that's basically... The, the blessing in Islam. And the ultimate blessing is when you look to the Prophet, peace be upon him. You can see the bravery. You can see the courageousness. You can see the, the, the masculinity of the Prophet, but you can also see the empathy. You can also see the mm -hmm. soft side. You can also see the emotional intelligence. You have two sides. The, the first side is when there is a big, a big, like basically not the big bang with the universe, but a big bang, like a loud, like loud thump, a loud noise, a loud almost explosion kind of, you know, ear rattling, nerve wrecking sound. And in the middle of the desert, you don't hear a lot of that. You hear mm -hmm. here, you're like, they're doing construction, right? In the middle of the desert, you hear a big noise. You're like, what the heck was that? When the people were kind of speculating, what is it, you know, and getting ready to go check it out, the Prophet, they saw them, the Prophet Muhammad was already on his way back. He was already on his way back from seeing what it was. He came on a horse, I believe without a saddle even. Uh, and he said, don't worry, I checked it out. It's nothing. You have that bravery, the man who fought in wars, the man that fought in battles, and the man that never gave up. You know, he was persecuted for years. He never gave up. And he, mm -hmm. being a follower who's persecuted is difficult, but being a leader who's persecuted is even more difficult because you yourself are persecuted and the people you are in charge of taking care of are persecuted as well. So that's difficult. So you had that side, but you also had the side of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he was basically laying close to his wife in bed, one of his wives. Can you guys still hear me? Want to make yeah, sure? Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. Keep tell going, tell us about the hadith, bro. So he was laying next to one of his wives. Mm. And she got her period. So, you know, she kind of crept out of bed and without without trying to disturb him. And she kind of... kind of like embarrassed and shy, you know? Yeah, she, she's clearly shy about it. Right? It's not something mm. she wanted to tell the Prophet. And the Prophet noticed that, right? He noticed it. So before she crept away too far, he asked, uh, basically, like, did you start your period? 
And she's like, yeah. So he wanted to show first that he acknowledges it. And secondly, he said, okay, when you come back, come back even closer to me than you were before. To show her that it's not something to be gross out about. I don't mind. I don't care. You're my wife. I love you. I want to be close to you. Small things like that. So you have both sides. And in that we have, as Allah says in the Quran, the perfect example for mankind. And that's why it's so clear for us. It's not just do this and do that. It's here is a man who literally lived the life that you should be living. Mm, bro, I want to touch on something real quick right now. The Adonis character that Hamza keeps talking about in his video. SubhanAllah, like it's in characteristics and in, in, in a lot of the, the traits, it's it's almost aligned with the Prophet Now, I'm not making a comparison between the two whatsoever. But a lot of the the things that you're saying, like Jeffrey does this, Jeffrey does that, Jeffrey's blue pill, Jeffrey's a spurg, but Adonis is this. He's not he's not too you know into this side of the extreme, but he's also not too into this side of the extreme, right? He's perfectly balanced and he's dominant, not in terms of being domineering to other people, but being dominant over his own self, which is which is the most difficult form of dominance to attain for the modern man. And this was the Prophet Sallam, bro. In every way, the the Prophet peace be upon him has maintained perfection and mastery just like rami was saying right he was never to this way he was never to that way he had emotional intelligence but he was very dominant he was very masculine and i think that these are the types of role models that people are lacking today they're like oh what author should mm -hmm. i follow you know what youtuber should i follow the issue with this is when you follow someone and you glorify them to such a degree when they're not divine i guess sent divinely sent role models you fall victim to this echo chamber where you take everything they say as truth i'll give you an example there's a youtuber ams right everyone knows ams bro this there's some good stuff he says bro but there's some some sleazeball stuff he says and he's shameless about it too if you follow him to a certain extent that you're like i'm gonna follow everything he says i'm just following ams then it's like if he says something that's objectively wrong right then you're kind of going to be a victim to that Right. But when you follow someone like the prophet, peace be upon him, just like you were saying, Hamza, that it gives you peace because you you have that surety, that that certainty. It really does, bro. Because before that, I was like, OK, I would follow this one YouTuber until this point. And then mm -hmm. I'd find a new YouTuber. Right now, it's like I have that consistency. It's like set in stone. I have felt that that's been uh, a problem being like an influencer, a leader, because as I give my own self-improvement uh, learning lessons, like my, my channel was never really meant to be this big. Honestly, it was literally just, I was just sat downstairs recording. Oh yeah, like I've been meditating and this is what I learned. And I would give quite unconventional advice compared to what like the big YouTubers were saying. And I, I felt like there was way more value in me just being unfiltered, authentic, and literally saying word for word, like the bad habits like in detail, whereas a lot of the big YouTubers, they kind of like cover it up. And I thought there was like a, um, like hidden point, like point of value that could be gained for some random guy who was, you know, watching this. But as I gained more and more of an influence and it's went to like 300,000, it was about 150K when I realized like these people are following every word that I say. And there was multiple times where I made some pretty big mistakes and I said some stupid advice and it, it, you know, it took me a while to realize that this is actually serious. It was when I did a visualization and I, I visualized like a politician getting ready for a speech. They're going to address 60,000 people, 80,000 people. Like that's, that's a big thing. That politician mm -hmm. is going to be briefed beforehand. They're going to prepare a script. They're going to be consulting body language experts. And here I was like, I don't even get changed before my, my videos. I just set up the camera, just say whatever comes up off the top of my mind. And so I said some stupid stuff of, of, praised the wrong things and have minimized the right things and mm. so the the idea of adonis then was almost like a a practice of humility for myself to say like okay that's where you you guys should be aiming for not me i've got it on my wall behind me to to make men more like adonis and not my, like myself because as a human being like we make so many mistakes and if someone's goal is to strive towards being like me they're going to make the exact same mistakes that I did and wise men learn from those mistakes so they don't have to make them themselves. It seems like if you're religious, if you practice Islam, like you've got such a clear path in front of you to follow what's already an organized, um, well, what, how would you say? Like what's already a all positive role model. Mm -hmm. I agree um, with that, bro. All positive, but first and foremost, truth. As, as close to truth as you can get. Right. You can follow red pill and you can go down this route and then you can find out, okay, this was right, this was wrong. You can follow feminism. 
like for women that want to be you know brainwashed and programmed and then you can be hopefully you know because most of them they they just look like they're they're too into that to even have that self-awareness um but you can realize okay they're saying it you can follow anything but all we're saying is why waste your time why not have something that will literally tell you that from the beginning that this is literally it this is the straight path you know and i love that you mentioned that in another video too you said that you know these people these muslims they look like they're you know imagine fearing allah and knowing that you're going to be held accountable by allah how are you going to do something you know bad when you said that in that video i i innately just resonated with that as a muslim because we know first and foremost that doing you know in red pill they're like oh do this you know how to not get caught let's say for example if you want to cheat on your spouse right we know that it's easy to fool a girl <laughs> no one let's not cap it's it's there's no it doesn't it's not you know rocket science or anything to fool another human being but how are you going to fool allah who's always watching right and this is the this is the difference between the mu'min the believer and someone who's not a believer right if you're a believer you know that you are going to be questioned and you are going to be judged and and you know assessed for every single deed that you committed you know and your sins are not going to be you know forgotten just because no one caught you right in mm. in, in western law this is this is the issue right what's the speed limit bro on the speed let's say like 100 kilometers an hour right a lot of people are speeding, bro. Only some people get caught, right? So these people are not speeding because, or these people are not not speeding when there's a cop there because they want to actually, you know, protect the law and, and submit to the law. They're just not speeding because they don't want to get caught. You know what I mean? Here, it's not about getting caught or not getting caught because we know that we're caught and we're booked 24-7, right? So that in and of itself gives people a little bit of an ego death, but I don't want to get too much into that, but... TLDR, it gives you an immense level of accountability and responsibility, first and foremost, from Allah, right? People can say whatever, but you got to be solid 24-7. And I believe as a man, that is the most masculine thing that you could do, mm -hmm. which is constantly be mindful of that. People that are into meditation, they know about that. And mm -hmm. it's not easy, bro. It's, it's much easier said than done. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And just to piggyback off that point, I want to give an example that uh, Anhal gave since the beginning. He basically the examples like when you when you're trying to put an IKEA piece together, a piece of furniture or something from IKEA, you could do it with the instruction manual and basically mm -hmm. know exactly what you're doing. Or you can throw it away and just try and do it yourself. <laughs> and maybe you'll get it right, maybe you'll get it wrong, maybe you'll get some parts right, you'll leave maybe a screw out here or there and not get it fully right because you're doing it yourself. You're trying to figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's something as simple as putting together a piece of furniture that's designed to be put together. Um based on the manual or based on the pieces even you can kind of put it together in your mind imagine something as complex as life mm. with morality with right with wrong with good with the bad with emotion with with uh everything basically everything life has to offer you can either just with your limited knowledge and your biases and your your desires which are all forces that are driving you already try and figure it out yourself and this is the funny part even if let's say you figured it out perfectly you won't even know that you did Hmm. you won't even know because how can you prove it you can't so you can try and never get there or you can have an instruction manual from the one who created you and created life and that's what dean is actually a more definitive answer and the, the brother the brother said they were right but a more definitive more descriptive definition is a full system of life that encompass encompasses our belief and our actions both our belief and our actions. So we know what to believe because God reveals to us what is true in terms of God existing, the angels existing, heaven and hell, day of judgment, all that stuff. But he also tells us how to live life. What can you do? What can't you do? There's not a thing or an action on the face of the earth that Islam doesn't say, yes, it's allowed or it's not allowed or it's perm permissible, it's preferred, it's disliked. There's some kind of ruling for it that comes from the Quran and from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that's what Islam is. It, it's, it's an answer for life. Not just man's greatest, greatest questions of, oh, how did I get here? What am I doing here? Where am I going? It answers those, but it also answers... Sorry, I got a call. It also answers, is it beneficial for me to do this? Should I do this? Should I not? Is this right? Is this wrong? And what is a man? <laughs> <laughs> 
Bro, I was laughing at those comments, man, saying that if Hamza becomes Muslim, he'll perfectly be the fourth Muslim. And bro, all we'll say is Amin, you know, inshallah, if God wills. Um, but Hamza, bro, what's what's on your mind? Because what Rami is saying about this this complete way of life, this is only found in Islam, bro. Other religions, comparative religions, we can talk about that on the next podcast, right? But there's there's a there's another major religion. I don't want to name it by name right now because people are gonna get triggered, but it has belief which we call aqidah, right? But it doesn't have sharia, like the, the rights and wrongs being questioned, that moral conduct. You believe in this and then you'll be saved. You'll have salvation. You don't have to have a level of conduct in your lives. You, you're not going to be questioned on what you do. But in Islam, we don't have that, bro. You, you can't guarantee that just because you say you'll believe, you're not going to go to hell, right? There has to be this, this level of right and wrong, halal and haram and all that. Accountability. And we'll that What's that? Accountability. Accountability, exactly, bro. Yeah. Hamza, bro, what's up? Mm. So I said that in the video that I made that if you do, I think it was the the two Muslim women in the jacuzzi video, and I said that if you, for those women, if they believe in Islam, then you have a god level of accountability. And we say in self improvement, accountability is like one of the most important factors. It's what everyone's paying a personal trainer for, and uh, it's what you just said, Faye, that. It, it's always there. It, when you were saying that, it made me think like you guys must be, you must have so much integrity to those values because, do you know what? Like I've always noticed this concept that I will act in a certain way when there's viewers, when there's someone who's there, but you have someone there watching you all, all the time. So the, the example I gave ages ago was that I'll, I'll always run faster. Like if, if I'm on a run, I'll always run faster if there's other people, especially women there. So when I'm by myself, there's no one around. I'll, like, I'll slow down. I'll get tired. And if there's like a group of girls who's my age or something, like I'll run faster. But it's like, I know it's, it's an autistic example, but I feel like you guys would like run faster, but like all the time. Yeah. Mm. Bro, it's, it goes back to this thing known as taqwa. Taqwa is God consciousness. It's, you're constantly aware that well, God is always there. Right. And it, it goes back to what we were saying in the beginning. Like, I'm about to get back to you in a second, bro. I completely just <laughs> lost my train of thought for real, for real, honestly. I'm the love. Damn, I just, like I'm gonna that. give a quick disclaimer to anyone that is, you know, sending a super chat or, or uh, you know, your YouTube member. We're gonna get us and Hamza to answer your questions all at the end. We're gonna do like a little 20 minutes set aside, 30 minutes set aside at the end for Q and A. But we're just gonna try to keep the main section of the podcast unfiltered. But yeah, bro, per pertaining to this whole taqwa this god level of accountability you're right bro you know you're saying you guys must live your life you know like like you know solid and and this it's like we're still we're still human beings bro so i want you to understand this that we still sin right I'm, and we're not going to air our sins but you know we're not supposed to do that as muslims but we still sin bro the prophet peace be upon him said every son of adam is a sinner the best of those that are, are those that repent you know, so there's no denying that we're all sinners. We're not going to be here with this false pious, you know, that, you know, we don't sin or anything. We're not supposed to, but we're all sinners, bro. But at the end of the day, like one of the, the pious, I believe it was a pious predecessor or one of the companions of the prophet, peace be upon him. He said that if I disobey Allah, I, I reckon the effects of it in the behavior of my wife or the camel that I ride. I want to talk about this for a bit because, you know, First of all, let me ask you, bro, when, when you hear this, what's your interpretation before I tell you? Say it again, please. Yeah, so when I disobey Allah, I reckon the effects of it in the behavior of my wife or the camel that I ride. When he goes against uh, his integrity, his values, he notices like a, maybe a lack of respect from his wife or his camel and like more problems in his life. 100%. This is one thing that I want to speak on just personally. After you know being on Dean, I noticed the effects of slip ups in exact real time. When I was before Islam, you know, red pill or falling anything else, it's like I would go deeper into my disobedience to Allah. I would go deeper into just doing whatever and being in this echo chamber. But right now, when you genuinely understand that Allah loves you and you have that connection to try to like please Allah, right? If you even do a minor slip up, you'll notice this, bro, in your life. And I think this in and of itself is a blessing, bro. Hamza, have you noticed anything like that in your life where it's like you're doing something you shouldn't 
and Allah doesn't owe you anything because you're the creation. He's the creator, but you get that type of like real time feedback. What do you mean by real time feedback? Real time feedback that's like if you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing, it's like you notice the effects right away. Mm. Yeah, there's always like you have that argument in your consciousness. You just know that you're going against your goals or your values. And I'm relating a lot of what you've just said then to my experiences in the things like the red pill. And so it's that idea that um if, for example, you go off your purpose you'll notice that women just are less attracted to you. They'll treat you with less respect. And I can see that happening with everything that you do, the, the people that you come across, friends, family, uh, the way that you work. So it's interesting that I can see that link. And like you said, like you can see truths in the red pill. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. like you were saying, it, it all comes back to taqwa. Like, if you don't have the guy consciousness, then you're not aware of this feedback, right? Like it'll happen in front of you. And like to you, you just, you're ignorant to it. You can't see it. It's almost like there's a veil covering it. And it's not till it gets like terrible, terrible to where you realize, oh, there's something off here. Like look at a guy who is doing no fat. Right? Like let's say he goes, Several weeks, he's feeling good and he's feeling confident. He's out there, you know, talking, socializing, getting girls' numbers, doing all this good stuff, right? He has a slip up and he relapses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Inherently, in the beginning, he's not going to see anything, but there are things that are happening right there and then, like instant feedback, which if he had God consciousness, he would catch on to it right there and then. Right, but it, then time progresses, and let's say he relapses again, and then again, and then again, and he, so much to the point where now he's back in this in the beginning. He's back to the point where he was before he even uh, started, or maybe he's worse. And now he can see, oh damn, like there's definitely something that happened here because now life isn't the same as when I was several weeks on no fat. And it's like if he had the guy consciousness, he would have caught on to it immediately. He could have altered his direction and what i wanted to say earlier i remembered alhamdulillah is that with the guy consciousness since it's always there like the accountability is always there like bro before we even started this live stream the first thing i was like telling you about like oh you're doing a great job and then i said something about like i was gonna say plebs and like, if you think about it, like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. But the thing is, like, to me, I have God consciousness. I know God's watching, and I know I'm gonna be held accountable for everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, everything in general. So when I I'm about to say something like that, I'm like, whoa, like I I gotta hold myself. Like even if it's not that big of a deal, I don't know that at the end of the day. So it's like I gotta make sure that you know I'm dotting all my eyes and crossing all my T's here because being watched 24 7 and that's mm -hmm. that's the beauty bro that's the beauty of god consciousness like if you have that accountability like what does that do to you as a man you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and i want to say that it's it's not fear-mongering whatsoever it's not being controlled or anything because people people want to say oh i don't want to be muslim i don't want to follow organized religion because i want to be free bro people don't realize that if you're not following a religion you're still following something everyone even atheists i don't believe personally anyone can be an atheist right everyone's still making something their god right allah says in the quran have you seen the one that makes their nafs their rub their their desires their god right so the, every single person you, you know you can't tell me otherwise i challenge someone to tell me you you don't believe and and make something your god something your god encompass right but in islam there's we we understand what's right and wrong objectively right we don't have to make things up like anha was saying about this taqwa too i want to touch on a point that there's a huge misconception that people have that you know that are in the red pill sphere right they think that when you become religious you now have to let go of pleasure and sexual desires and all this listen there i'm not gonna lie right there are religions bro there are religions not you know d d definitely not god um, imposing this right this is self-made man-made ideas right but there are religions that have self-imposed celibacy 
right? I don't know where they got this from. Definitely not from Allah, right? Like if you want to be a member of this one house of God or this community, you have to, you know, give up your sexual desires. But then you see the byproduct of that in them abusing little boys, bro. You know what I mean? So I'm, what I'm saying is there's, there's sexual desires and intimacy is something very natural, you know, sent to our fitrah by Allah. And in Islam, we don't shy away from these things, bro. There was a group of little boys and the Prophet ﷺ went to them and said, um, you know, if you will have the ability to get married, get married, right? Um, if you can't, then fast because fasting diminishes sexual power. This is extremely powerful because we are told from a young age, right? If we are above, you know, age of, you know, puberty, and, you know, we have the provisioning, we have the ability to get married, get married, don't wait on this, right? In Red Pill, you know, sphere and, and you know, this whole manosphere in general, the ones that are not on deen, they're like, oh, I want to have, I want to spin all my plates. I want to, bro, you want to spin plates in Islam, you can have four wives because Allah, the creator has literally created you and he understands your natural fitra. This is not some man-made ideology or religion, like I mentioned before, where it's like you have to be monogamous. No. Yeah. women have to be monogamous right and we'll get to that in a bit why they have to be monogamous why there's a difference not because we hate women or we're misogynist um and why men can be polygamous right a lot of things like assuring paternity and you know all that other stuff but the tldr is we don't have shyness towards intimacy right we don't have but we don't have promiscuity that's the thing because when you're promiscuous it literally destroys and erupts your soul and you get to a point where there's no accountability anymore. There's no responsibility anymore. Um, the red pills, you know, you, YouTubers, they like to talk about, you know, don't get with thoughts, don't do this. But little do they know that every time you're promiscuous and you're like, okay, I'm going to wait till I'm, I'm 30, 40 to get married. I'm just going to sleep with this, a bunch of women that I can. You're literally creating another damaged woman, bro, to some extent, because you have no intention of being with her. So every time a woman um, and a man, too, sleeps with a partner and they don't you know, stay with them, it's just a partner and it kind of takes away at their soul a bit, you know? Have you had a little mm -hmm. bit of experience with that in, in terms of, you know, your videos you were talking about promiscuity or casual sex ruins your soul? What did you mean by that? Mm. Do you know, it was only when I stopped having casual sex whilst intoxicated. So when I was having casual sex sober, so I stopped taking drugs in probably uh, 2019, 2020. And so all the times, so most of the casual sex I had was whilst like drunk and on like MDMA and everything. And when I started, like, you know, I took a step away from uh, drugs, but then still continued having casual sex. And it was kind of like I spoke about it on my earlier videos where it was like my reward for self-improvement that instead of watching movies or playing video games, like on Saturday or something, I'd go on Tinder and go with the, on a date with a girl. It was then when it was sober and I was a lot more mindful and present that I realized like how damaging it actually was that I would find myself just like thinking about 10, 20 different girls you know, over the course of like a month or so and like you get a random flash of them and especially with girls that I truly connected with and spent a lot of time with. And I could feel like my soul, my body, my mind, like yearning for them. Like the connection was there still to this day with, with multiple different girls. I'll, I'll go about my day. Maybe it'll happen in this podcast or, you know, I'll be doing something completely ra random. And it's like, I feel my body embrace her. Like we've truly connected and you're hit with this, this incredibly sad feeling that now that connection isn't there because it was always, it was the foundation was always cracked. It was always through like this degenerate idea of like, Oh, you know, we just hooked up from a club and mm. I, I feel a lot of pain from that personally. Okay. Okay. See, I get that, bro. And that's why when we, when we have a nikah, people don't know what a nikah is. You might know a nikah is basically the, the ceremony that a man and woman gets married Islamically, right? Marriage in Islam is not the same as, you know, institutional legalized marriage, right? I want to make this very clear. People in, in the red pill sphere, they have this huge like fear that like, oh, I don't want to get married. She's going to take half your stuff. And listen, in Islam, we don't have this. We don't have unfair alimony laws and settlement laws and any of this in Islam getting married can literally take five to ten minutes bro you need uh two witnesses right this is how an islamic nikah has done two witnesses you need uh the per the permission of the the woman's guardian or the father and you need the the dowry that's it bro and you're done but 
the main message is not how simple it is to get married in Islam, but the main message is once you do it, you have the blessing of Allah. You have the barakah of Allah, right? That's what sets that precedence. Just like you were saying, hooking up with casual women and, and doing this, you don't have that there because it's not there. You know, you're not going to fake it. So you're going into it with the expectation that is is set to crumble, bro. Things that that build, you know, easily crumble just as as easily, bro. But in, in a marriage, it's different, right? But this is not the same type of institutional marriage that I want to make clear. Is the, the heaviness is is removed because you're married in the eyes of Allah, not in terms of the government and the law of the land, which is kind of corrupt, bro. Let's be honest. Mm. So what's the difference between nikah and like a Western marriage? Well, the thing with the Western marriage is more of a business, bro. I hate to say it, right? Mm -hmm. It all started with lawyers realizing that, you know, most marriages are failing. And I believe those at the top that are working with them know that pushing this, you know, alphabet gang and feminism propaganda and all of this, it's just going to lead to more men being feminine and women being masculine. And all that's going to lead to is more marriages crumbling. But when they look at, you know, the main incentive behind this it's money bro divorce lawyers and alimony lawyers make the most money one of the highest you know paid jobs in law period this is undisputed but when you look at an islamic marriage there is none of there's no divorce lawyers or alimony settlements divorce is permissible in islam right but marriage is simpler in an islamic marriage you have roles and responsibilities right just like i mentioned before but you have the blessing from Allah, the barakah from Allah, and you guys are together. Done. And now intimacy is permissible now. Seeing her without her hijab is permissible now. Right? In Western marriage, it's just an institutional contract in a way. Right? There are other religions too, which say till death do your part where you can't technically divorce. Right? That's not Islam. Right? Allah, if Allah really is your creator, he understands your fitra and your needs and divorce is permissible bro it's it's disliked but it's permissible why is it disliked because if it wasn't disliked then we would just willy-nilly right just get married to whoever and just divorce Mm -hmm. them later right so the wisdom behind that is we shouldn't we should take it seriously right but i also want you to understand that in western marriage right why do you see people in the west bro oh i've been dating my girl for 10 years 15 years why don't you get married oh we're just not there yet Bro, maybe the guy has a fear that if we get married, that, you know, this is what's going to happen. There's this whole extravagance associated with Western marriage that you got to go down on one knee. You got to spend 50K on on the Mm. ring itself. Then you got to spend 250K on the actual wedding. If you don't, you're cheap, you know. And it's like, I want you to understand, bro, in an Islamic marriage, the Prophet said that the best of marriages are those that are cheaper, like lower, you know, in terms of they're not extravagant in terms of how much you invest in all that. Um, and you have the barakah, first and foremost. You won't have to wonder, is she with you because she's a gold digger or she only sees you as this? In, what's, in what's that? Sorry? The, the barakah. Barakah is blessing. You, you okay. have the blessing from Allah. This is, the, this is first and foremost the most important thing about a nikah, right? And you have that contract. It's set in stone with Allah, with that God-level accountability that you're talking about. Not just, okay, I have to maintain this and, and whatever, you know. How many people are in sexless marriages and, and completely destroyed marriages in Western marriages, but they don't want to leave because they know she's going to take 500K if I leave, right? In Islam, we don't have that, right? So there's a huge stark contrast between Western marriage and a nikah. Okay. How does it work with a man having f- multiple wives? <clears throat> give me give me a better <laughs> look, look at that smile on Anha, bro. Give, <laughs> give, me, give me a better question. Um, uh, like elaborate that a bit. Uh, because you mentioned it before. So mm. um a man can have four wives, yes. a woman can't. I assume yes. that's because of provisioning. Not just provisioning. So there's a lot of things. So <clears throat> in Islam, plural marriage or polygamy, specifically I want to say polygyny, right? Because polygamy just means multiple partners. Polygyny is one man with multiple partners, right? Um, This is permissible in Islam, and it's the sunnah. Sunnah meaning the Prophet, peace be upon him, did it, right? It's a way of his life. This is permissible in Islam, and it's also favorable at times, so I'll say this. How does it work? Well, a man makes a nikah with all of them, just like I mentioned, right? The wisdom behind it is a lot of things. So number one, one man, multiple women. 
let's talk about war. Let's talk about times where women don't have, there's more, you know, women period, right? You look at, you know, secular studies, they already proved this, that, you know, there's more women than men, right? At times of war and times of hardships, right? You know, that cycle where it's like good men create, times create like, uh, yeah, yeah, all that, right? So we're in that cycle right now where the society is headed to where we have weak men and they've created hard times. That's going to create, you know, even look at what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, right? Is an inevitability in just the way that the dunya works that we're always going to have more women and less men. So plural ma- marriage is a solution to that by not having women that are not looked out after, not provided for, not taken care of, not protected, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? The second thing I want to say is it's a man's innate fitra to provide. Just like you were saying, bro, you know how you were, I think you made it in a video where you're like, a man has to provide and a, and a good woman, right? You made it in an unfiltered video. You said that submissiveness is not a bad thing necessarily. And nurturing and protecting the house is a good thing right so i want to say that for a man it's naturally in his fitra to provide a man wants to be provided for and to be appreciated right on his provisioning a woman's not really the same way can she work of course right islam doesn't prohibit women working but all i'm saying is it's in a man's fitra or nature to want to provide so if a man provides right multiple women he can take care of multiple women women right um furthermore it's sunnah to to you know get married to women that have that are single mothers right and this is a huge thing that I, that you know we can go down this rabbit hole another podcast right because a lot of people are like why why you know is it a sunnah to marry single mothers or widows or etc et right so we'll talk about that for sure because sunnah, sunnah is uh it's the practice that's um uh, Rami, chime in, bro. My, no, my like mind saying, is terrible saying, today, bro. Action, bro of the prophet. Sunnah is, is the way of the, the prophet. The way of the prophet. Yeah, you know? yeah. and, and it's a sunnah. We'll talk about that in another episode, right? Yeah. But that's a really, we, yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, it's recommended... It's, to, no, it's not recommended. Uh, See, it's not, it's no one's. It's not rec- There's not a specific recommendation, um, to marrying, but it's it's a sunnah, right? There's a lot of sunnahs that are recommendations, but we could talk about that later too. But yeah. it's allowed. A, a single mother in the West, more times than not, might not necessarily be the same as a single mother in Islam, right? We look at all these women and men that are not taking accountability for their sexuality, and their their virtue in a way but in islam we don't have that right so it's different but anyway that's solved provisioning protected protection all that's solved a lot of people are wondering why can't it be the other way around why can't a woman have multiple men well there's this huge issue of the assurance of paternity right if you have one man sleeping with multiple women everyone knows who the mother and father is of all the kids women never have this innate i guess concern that men have right you know what i'm talking about that is it my kid because a, a kid physiologically, like a baby, literally physiologically comes out of a woman. She doesn't have any doubt in the world. It's like 50% hers in terms of genetic composition. A man does not. Yes, I know today in this mm. whole satanic world that we live in, there's, you know, paternity tests and all this. I'm not talking about that, right? But a woman never, and Andrew Tate talked about this in a video that he made. He said that the way things were once upon a time was to guarantee purity, right? So you look at women and men. When a man has multiple wives, he can guarantee all of the kids are his. And a woman can, each of the women can guarantee, this is my kid. But when you have it the other way around, you can't guarantee that. If a woman has multiple partners, multiple men, you can't guarantee which kid is who's, like, who's the father. Islam, um, fatherhood, kinship, lineage, right? This is huge. This is of utmost importance because we need to know who the father is. You look at kids growing up today, statistics can show, you know, they grow up without a father. What happens to them? You know, they grow up in single mother homes. What happens to them, right? In Islam, we don't have that. We don't, we don't even want to place the chance that this could happen. That's why it's not mm. that plural women, uh, plural marriage for women is unrecommended. It's haram. It's forbidden, right? So for a man, marrying is practical. For a woman, it's impractical, mainly because of the the whole you don't know who the the father is but also think about it, having kids bro if one man wants to have let's say an average of two kids Rami said this in a video and the woman wants to have four husbands bro if i'm if a woman gets pregnant once she's out of commission for pretty much nine ten months bro you know so for her to get pregnant again let's say it'll take two years for the first husband for for both kids then she has to do it again it's like it's not really practical bro right and mm-hmm. pl- plural mar- marriage polygyny right one man with multiple women is only the thing that naturally makes the most sense you see a lot of men in the red pill sphere saying i just want variety see 
men and women are different in that too, right? When a woman truly loves and submits to a man, she doesn't want another man, right? But for a woman, for a man, if he truly loves you, if he wants another woman, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you as much as you know he says he does. It's just an innate fitra type of you know hardwired mechanism in us, bro. We can't control that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I just want to jump in really quickly. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to overburden the brother because a lot was said. <laughs> but uh, the best way to define things like this and explain things like this is with the Quran, how it's built. So I'm going to try and make it very clear, inshallah. When it comes to nikah, we are required to have a, a proper wedding Islam, two male witnesses, a bridal gift or a dowry, or we call it mahr for the woman, the protector, the guardian, usually the father or brother or uncle of the woman, um, the marriage contract and the groom. I don't think I'm missing anything. That's what's required for an Islamic marriage. If a, if a man does this, he's basically taking the, the position of guardian from the brother, mm -hmm. father, uncle upon himself and essentially saying, I will provide and take care of and protect um, mm -hmm. uh, your daughter, your sister, whoever it is. That's his responsibility. Now, if he does this times four, which four is the max, and I'll go, we'll talk about that. Then he has four, four, is, four, four is the max at one, one time. Yeah. 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 So he's basically saying that I will take care of this woman times four for his four mm -hmm. wives. That's essentially what it is. The only reason we're really having this discussion is in the West, we are monogamous. If in the mm -hmm. West we were religionists, then we wouldn't talk about it. It wouldn't be an issue. It would just be how it mm -hmm. is. But I just want to throw it out there. When it comes to religion, yeah. God says in the Quran, um, marry in twos, threes, and fours. But if you cannot be just between them, if you cannot be fair between them, meaning you provide basically equally to them you give equal time to them you're fair and just if you can't be just and fair then marry only one it's a direct command from god so only men who are in a certain position who are capable uh, of actually being fair with their wives are allowed to men who don't have that mm -hmm. ability are not allowed to mm -hmm. and look how beautiful that is bro like you get in the car you're taking the ownership of like, okay, I'm the one that has to take care of her. I'm the one that has to provide. I'm the one that has to do all this. And it's like, look, for men, we develop under pressure. It's in us, you know, like if we don't have pressure, if we have a comfortable life. Like, brother, if I'm, if I'm here at my parents' house and I have all the luxuries in the world, all the food that I could want, and I can make money, I can make all the money that I want through here, like, I'm sorry, but it's not going to be the same as if, like you said in your video, as if you got a girl and you got her pregnant and you got this kid on the way. Mm -hmm. It changes the dynamic. It changes the way that you see things. Like it, it basically, to put it in simple terms, it lights a fire under your ass. And like the most growth that we as men uh, experience is when we are under pressure. So I think that right there, that's very beautiful that the man is taking that uh, responsibility when you do marry a woman. And it's very important to say this here because I was one of the guys that when I saw that we could marry four women in Islam, I was like, oh, boy, I'm so, like, sign me up. <laughs> you know, like, I think it's very important to say that uh, it, it can't be out of desire. Like, mm. you, you can't say, oh, I desire to be with multiple women, so therefore I'm going to marry multiple women. Because, again, like Rami said in the Quran, God says very clearly, if you can't be just, if you can't support them, don't do it. it it's it's going to end very horribly if you do. He's saying it very clearly right there. And then, as well, you have to understand, like, your intention matters most. So if your intention to get married to multiple women is just to fulfill your sexual desires, bro, like there's, there's going to be some yeah. issues. But mm -hmm. like Fire was saying, if you have these women who they have kids and they no longer are married, and they just have, they have no one to provide for them, to protect them, to do any of this stuff. At that point, that's no longer desire. Now you are taking on another responsibility to be able to take care of this woman and the children that she's bringing as well. And um, I guess the last thing I want to say is that if a man truly were to do this, right, if a man were to truly uh, be with multiple women, not out of desire, but because he, he's genuinely doing it for the sake of God, like he, he genuinely mm -hmm. wants to help, 
he wants to provide and um, protect these people, these, these women and these children. Like, imagine the growth that this man would occur, incur, mm. I should say. That's, that's crazy, bro. Yeah. Mm. That's the thing, bro. It's not. It's not just desire, right? Oh no, like there has to be something more, bro. There has to be that accountability, and in Islam, bro, being intimate with your wife—that's literally an act of worship, bro. This is something a lot of people don't know. Like you literally get good deeds for sleeping with your wife, and you get bad deeds for not and for sleeping with someone that's not your wife. Like how how amazing is that, bro? Because people think that we got to be over pious or we we got to be shamed for our sexual intimacy. No, bro. It just we have we have a virtuous way of doing things. Mm. I like the sound of all this. I'm not gonna lie. Because I've seen some arguments against this, and I actually had like a little debate with a couple of my friends about this, and you know, it made me realize that this it's going on in the West anyway. Like polygyny, like this idea. Okay, one man with multiple women. Well, mm. it's exactly what's happening right now. It's exactly what I've been doing. But mm. I would just have the extra responsibility to like look after those women. It, it, mm. It's. I'm coming from you know a Western perspective right now, and it, it's strangely like um, it's the opposite of what I can imagine. Like some feminist who's arguing with this point, where she says it's like it's sexist towards women. It, the West is like what we're doing right now around where like one you know Chad is sleeping with a bunch of girls. Well, how is that not bad then? If this is just, okay, well, now that guy should take responsibility for you. He should take ownership of you. That makes him more of a man. The women that he wants to sleep with now get way more of his commitments. Literally, bro, 100%. That's that's all it is, bro. In in the West, you look at celebrities or you look at high-value men, right? They have a work wife. They have a side thing. They have that mm. booty call. They have that 3 a.m. They have their main thing. It's like in Islam... There's nothing done, you know, behind the scenes. There's no dirty business, bro. It's all out in the in the forefront in, because it's out in, in the eyes of Allah anyway, right? So so why go around doing all these these sneaky business anyway, right? So it's like you have that four as a cap at, at simultaneously, right? You can marry more than four wives, but not at the same time. So a man must only have four wives simultaneously maximum, but he can be monogamous if he chooses to, right? Some prophets were monogamous. Some prophets were polygamous. It's fine, right? But for a woman... You know, it doesn't work the same way. I also want <clears throat> to, with Rami and Anho, I do want to go over some of the fundamentals about Islam. But before that, do you have any questions, bro? Because I know last time you said you had some questions. Can you teach me how to pray? Of course, of course bro. Of we course. got you, man. We got what you. What did you write here, bro? On stream. We'll, we'll do it on stream, bro. We'll do it live. Um, <laughs> Let's get Rami getting ready, bro. Before, go ahead, yeah, bro. first, I'll, Rami, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Rami, do you want to kind of go over what prayer is, how it's not just the secular, spiritual, it is a spiritual connection, but it's not just about you, but it's actually worship. And do you want to then talk about like how we as Muslims, why we pray and just go into that? Yeah. So firstly, I want to say Salat al Jumrah. speaking of prayer, Jumrah is, is a Friday prayer we attend uh, every Friday. Uh, it's obligatory for men. It's coming up soon, so I'm going to have to bounce sooner. But to answer the question... Salah, the word we use in Arabic when we talk about, oh, teach me how to pray. You don't need someone to teach you how to, you know, talk to God from your heart. You're just like, hey, God, you know, thank you for what you've given me. I appreciate it. Can you give me this, you know, this, this and that. Success, success in my business, good help. You don't need someone to teach you that. What we're referring to is something called Salah. Salah linguistically means connection, right? And it's literally a connection with God in a way. And we have five of these a day. You know, they say Muslims pray five times a day. We have five obligatory prayers a day. You can pray more if you want. You can pray recommended prayers and stuff. But at least five obligations uh, or obligatory prayers. So dua is the word we use uh, for kind of calling on God, speaking to him in a kind of uh, more, I would say, Christian sense of the word prayer. We only have the word prayer in English, right? <clears throat> But in, in, in uh, Islam, in Arabic, like I mentioned, Salah is more specific. So what Salah is, is it's a dedicated prayer at a certain time of the day. For example, Fajr is uh, an hour or so before sunrise. Maghrib is during sunset. Isha is later in the night. And then you have like Asr, which is like the midday prayer, and Duhur, which is like the afternoon prayer. And you have a certain amount of time to pray these prayers. And it, it's good, it takes discipline, and it's, it's beautiful. So what you do, 
as you go. Uh, basically, I'm not going to go through the full prayer, but you say Allahu Akbar, which means God is greater. And the blessing in saying that God is greater and not just the greatest is you're not just establishing that God is the greatest. You're establishing that anything that comes to mind, God is greater than that. So you say Allahu Akbar and you do something called takbirat, which you put your hands up like this. And then you basically stand like this with your right hand folded over your left, your right arm folded over your left. And you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. <clears throat> Which uh, should I recite Surah Fatiha now? Go for it, go for it, go for it. Right. Well, bro, we'll send you some videos too on our group chat, so don't worry about you know how to yeah. pray. <clears throat> All right, feel free to close your eyes, inshallah, if it helps. Um, but I'll be like, Minish Tom Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah, you're up in the Alameen, Arahman Rahim. مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين 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 رب That is a surah Amen. that we recite every single time we pray and it basically translates to Praises to God, uh, Alhamdulillah, praises to God, the Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all of the worlds, everything that exists. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman is the one who is generally merciful to every, all of his creation. In this life, that's what Ar-Rahman is. And Ar-Rahim is the especially merciful, who gives mercy to those who go, their, go out of their way to seek it. Ar-Rahim. Malik Yawm din owner of the Day of Judgment. You alone we worship. And when we say you alone we worship, what we're also saying is you are the only one I obey. I don't make my own laws. I don't let the government, I mean, we, we obey the law of the land, but I don't let them tell me what's morally right, what's morally wrong mm -hmm. in my religion, in my life. I That's God's job. And I accept God. And you alone we ask for help. We know that we can ask people for help, but it's not going to come to us unless God wills. Uh, keep us on the straight path the path of those who you have favored and blessed um, not those who have earned your anger or nor those who have went astray so you could see that the first the half, first half is praising God the second half is asking God so it's almost like a dua like you're praying like you're asking God for things after you praise him <clears throat> And then the rest of it, you know, we go, we bow basically to God. We put our head on the floor to God. And when we have our head on the floor, we say, Subhanahu Rabbil Ala, which means praises to God, the most high. So when our highest point is at the lowest part of the ground, or well, the ground, the lowest part, we say praises to God, the most high. Establishing that God is the highest and compared to God, we're, we're basically nothing. And it's very, very beautiful. And we'll go more in depth into it, inshallah, so you can establish that connection. But we pray because God tells us to pray. We know that there's wisdom behind it. We know that there's benefits behind it. We know that. It, it, it increases us spiritually. It blesses us mentally. Uh, and even physically, certain positions that you enter in are, are good for your, uh, you know, your back and certain body parts. Even like going in a bowing position, it's, you know, it strengthens the legs in the back. <clears throat> and uh, although we do it for the sake of God, it does have those, uh, those kind of benefits. But mm. regardless, we'll go more into depth, inshallah, soon. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We all got to bounce soon. Habibi, I wanted to Thank say you, that. Man. Bro, you got, look at that smile on Hamza's face, bro. Look at that nur, mashallah. Bro, little do you know, there was a companion of the Prophet, so some Hamza, Hamza radiallahu anh, mm. And he was the Chad, bro. You know, we're talking about Donis and all that. Hamza was the man, the warrior, right? So Ramadan is around the corner too, bro. Ramadan is in about a week, right? Ramadan is the month where the Quran was revealed, the month where we fast as Muslims, right? I'm sure you know about it. Um, mm -hmm. Other self-improvement YouTubers like Elliot Hulse, which we've had Elliot Hulse on an episode for those of you that didn't watch that, and I Am Lucid, you know, they fasted for Ramadan. And, you know, Ramadan is genuinely where you unplug, right? It's kind of like a dopamine detox, and you plug into out of the, the dunya, right? And the reason I'm telling you this is because remember how Rami said that we pray because Allah told us to pray? We also fast because Allah told us to fast. The scientific studies on, on meditation, mindfulness, fasting, right? On your hormones and your mental health, it's, it's unlimited, bro. But what I'm saying is we do this because Allah 
told us to do it, bro. And the best deeds to Allah are those that he has made obligatory, right? The most favorite deeds, right? So the things that Allah has made obligatory, how wonderful is it that those are the things that are best for us and Allah loves them the most. But if only we knew, bro. But just hearing that that basic, uh, you know, A to Z that Rami gave you about praying, you know, is there anything on your mind? Mm-mm. It sounded beautiful. I didn't realize it would be like a song. It's yeah. melodious. Yeah, it's melodious. Yeah, Allah commands us to re- to recite the Quran in a beautiful and melodious fashion, and some say even recite it in a serious way, where it's almost tear jerking, because what you're reciting is not like you know. Uh, I had a great day and, you know, I love my life. What you're reciting is, is the truth. It's, you know, like keep us on the straight path. Why? Because there's, you know, hell exists and I don't want to burn there. I don't want to be punished. I want to do exactly what I was meant to do, which is worship God, submit to him and hopefully get to Jannah. These are very, you know, passion inducing things. These are very important things, uh, which is why it is recited in that way. Uh, but alhamdulillah, bro, uh, the beauty is in the recitation. The beauty is in the Quran, bro, mm. the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's beautiful, man. It's a beautiful thing. Alhamdulillah. Hamza, bro, talk to us. I feel good. I appreciate you guys sharing this wisdom with me. It's been a very, very uh, interesting and positive conversation. Of course, bro. Of course. I also wanted to say that I want to give you like a personal invitation, bro. That Ramadan is around the corner, bro, in about a week. You know, try it out, bro. You don't have to, you know, be the best at it. But I genuinely want to say for me, and I know for Anhel too, because Anhel made, you know, he's been a Muslim for about a year, year and a half, just over that. And when he fasted for Ramadan, it was transformative, bro. Anhel, do you want to talk about, you know, your journey in Ramadan? Yeah, I keep it light because, I mean, I made videos on this, but it's, number one, is humbling because, like, bro, like, you, you're not eating. And like people, people have fasted, you know, some people have been like, oh, I've fasted. I've done like a water fast. Nah, but like, have you done a dry fast from sunrise? Actually, before sunrise is before the morning prayer because the morning prayer hits like an hour or so before sunrise. And once that morning prayer hits, like you can't eat, you can't drink anything. So imagine that an hour before sunrise, you can't eat or drink anything all the way up until sunset. Not many people have done that outside of Islam, you know, I, and I speak for myself here. Yeah, I never did that. So when I did it, it was, um, at first I realized, oh, this is not as hard as I thought it would be. And then from there on out, it's like, bro, like, you know how, like, you have these little moments throughout the day. And I'm not talking about why you fast. I'm just talking about, like, in general. You know how you have, like, little moments throughout the day where you you just kind of reflect and you might realize something you're like oh damn like that's crazy and it it makes a very big impact on you and i don't know just like maybe something in your childhood you remember something in your childhood and then it's like you process it and because you process it it's like some healing occurred you know what i'm saying you're just like present right yeah yeah well i mean you could say it like that but it's mm. like there's something that happens in that little moment in time that brief little period mm. bro when you're doing this dry fasting literally for how many hours is it it's it's from fajr to maghrib right before fajr so basically like, how, how much time it depends on where you are bro because some people have more daylight some people have less but let's say for us in the uk or for us in the west here fajr is around let's say 5 6 a.m so you you have to stop eating at like 4 or 5 a.m and you have to go till about sunset time which is like anywhere from like 7 to maybe even 8 9 p.m in the summer so it's tough bro Bro, that's that's 13 to 15 give or take Mm -hmm. 13 to 15 hours where you are literally in that self-reflective state if you so wish to be in even if you don't want to be in it it's still there like it's happening like there's so much healing and there's so much that's like happening bro like i can't even explain it man like after that one month i don't know man i i personally i never was the same i'll say that yeah mm-hmm. it is beautiful and bro honestly in some places the sun sets and rises at very specific times so they fast for like 18 hours a day yeah literally crazy but um 18, 
Yeah, I got I do got to bounce. I want to ask one question for the brother before I go. And then after this, I really do have to go, inshallah. So, uh, Habibi Hamza, where are you in terms of Islam? Like when you look at Islam, because you say like this is all beautiful. And I think a part of you also realizes that this can't really just come from, a, you know, a man who couldn't read or write in the desert 1400 years ago. You know what I mean? Like this kind of, this kind of um, practicality, this kind of blessing, this kind of guidance, this kind of beauty cannot come from a man who couldn't read or write in the desert 1400 years ago. And from people who are like, like if you look at like the Eskimos today, conquering America and Russia, that would be crazy. The small band of Arabs, Bedouin sheep herding uh, hmm. Arab, Arab people in the middle of the desert, ended up with the religion and worshiping God, conquering Rome and Persia and basically the entire world, which in their power remained in power for like 1300 years. We know that things like this in the guidance and beauty cannot come from a single man or even a group of men. I hmm. doubt it. Look, look at Red Pill, what they're trying to do. They can't even produce half or I would say they can't even produce 10% of what Islam offers, bro. And Islam is definitive. They're kind of all over the place. And that's just one group of people in the 21st century. So where are you in terms of coming back to Islam? Mm. Seems like it's a, uh, a process. <laughs> like I, it It's is. not something I could just like jump into. I can't imagine it's something that'll be quick. Uh, with everything you guys are saying, with, for example, praying and fasting, it's like my mind's automatically seeing the progressive overload variation. So it's like, instead of fasting for the entire month, try it for a day or try it with water, but not with food. And I'm, I'm taking like the, um, what what feels less friction for me, mm -hmm. because it, it seems like a huge lifestyle change. And you guys know it when, like we were actually supposed to have a pro podcast previously yeah. and I literally bailed beforehand because like the pressure got to me and I literally like, I got symptoms of being sick and like trauma and everything, like just uprising yeah. because as I said it in, um, I think it was one of our messages in the group chat. Like it's, it's, it's extremely painful to have your views challenged. Yeah. There's a lot of like processing that needs to go on and I need to spend like a couple of days with my journal. So one of the ideas that I did get is after this conversation, I'm sure we'll speak and I'm going to organize like a couple of days where I'm just like, I'm away for technology. All I've got is just like a pen and a piece of paper and I'm just going to see what comes out. That's, yeah. that's beautiful, bro. Alhamdulillah. And thank you, man, for sharing that. I, I had to ask, bro, like after this call, I'm like, I need to know what this guy is, you know, at spiritually. It's a beautiful thing. Do you have a Quran in your house? No. Okay. Inshallah. I'm sure I'm normal. Okay, if she doesn't, then I'll send you, inshallah, a translation of the Quran. I, I know a really good one, inshallah. So we're going to send you one uh, and, and just give it, give it a read, bro. Honestly, if we're talking like top tier evidence for Islam, it's going to be that book, inshallah. Uh, but with that being said, okay. bro, it was a pleasure. I know we're going to talk plenty in the future. Uh, brothers, may Allah bless you all. To everyone here, since I won't be here to say the dua. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adab al nar. I'm going to head to Jerma. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And see you guys later. Thank you for today. Bro, bro, bro. Listen, you take you take all the time that you need, right? As much as you need. I right, keyword. Um, reflect on it, bro. Journal. But when it comes to the the dry fasting, um, if you choose to do so, just know uh, God will make it easy for you. Like again, it sounds crazy. Like yo, I'm not gonna eat or drink. For like 13 to 15 hours like bro trust like i know i know it sounds crazy before um actually i won't even say that it doesn't even matter but the whole point of it is that like if you choose to do so god will make it easy for you and like i said that one day could turn to two could turn to three could turn to a week could turn to the entire month you know what i'm saying so just you know take take the time you need reflect on it and yeah, just rip the band-aid off, bro. At mm -hmm. least do one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Yes, sir. Yeah, bro. And I want to say one thing too that that's the Quran, bro. I'll send you some other stuff too. And the whole thing about prayer, bro, Salah, Jesus, peace be upon him, Moses, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of these prophets, right? Um some religions held them to higher, you know, ranks than just prophets, but we know they're all just prophets. All of them prayed the same way, bro. All of them prayed, just like Rami was saying, and they put their head on the floor, bro. If you're truly sincere, bro, and, and here's, the th here's the key thing, bro, truly sincere, 
and you generally you don't have to put your head down on the floor but if you have like a prayer mat and you want to do it i highly recommend you do it and just pray to god right you don't have to say allah because allah already knows who you're talking to bro it's just one god bro conversation between you and him and just sincerely ask to be guided bro i guarantee you if you're sincerely asking to be guided you will be guided bro inshallah god willing but that's the thing you have to have that sincerity you can't just be wanting to do it for some other affair or some other intention you need to you know if you genuinely see that this is it and i'm not even saying to be guided to islam bro just genuinely ask allah to be guided to the straight path and i'm sure anha's been doing this well before he was muslim and i can genuinely say anha was one of the many people that i know that were genuinely guided to islam they didn't guide themselves into it but they were guided and i think that's that's also different because in the self improvement journey most of the dunya things we have to lead ourselves right to have a good physique to have money it's we have to be in charge but for things like this it's kind of like the yin yang it's kind of like the opposing force where we have to like let go and let god almost in a way so it's a little bit of a mindset shift too from the usual i guess goals and aspirations that you have but i generally think bro it'll it will genuinely be the best decision that you will make for your dunya for this life and for the hereafter bro and me on how we're all attest to that fact bro so if there's any more questions for you let us know bro yeah i think yeah um nothing's coming in mind in terms of questions but i appreciate the conversation i was about to say bro like even if you had more questions i, I don't even want to hear them not because i don't want to hear them but because it's like all the answers the real answers is going to come from the self reflection mm -hmm. like being by yourself disconnecting from everything you know like i bro personally i want to tell you everything I want to just like throw it on you, but I know that's not the way. And I know that like, as humans, we become overwhelmed like this and like, bro, no one likes someone telling them what to do and all mm. this stuff. Like, so again, like, bro, you take your time, you reflect on it. All the answers will come to you when you reflect on it sincerely. Yeah, 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 bro. And in about a week or two, or, you know, as soon as, you know, we can all make the time, we'll do another podcast definitely on, you know, stuff like entrepreneurship, fitness and all that i think a lot of the brothers they need to hear this stuff so we'll definitely reach out to you and make this happen but if that's all we got some q a right now and then we can wrap it up bro let's do it all right oh no bro you want to read it out salam what's the ideal timeline for nofab right now hmm are you, are you asking when to start or is it just like timeline in general? It's a total timeline, I guess, to like heal or recover. Oh, that depends. It depends. Everyone's different. Someone might heal up in a week. Someone might take years. It all depends on like how long they've been doing it for, how deep were they doing it, for, like how many times <laughs> were they doing it. It's too many variables to just say, ah, three months. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Amza, what about you? Yeah, I totally agree. The NoFap community online is, uh, I think, pretty toxic. And I really don't like the the idea of this NoFap benefits time. I've, I've heavily criticized in the, the YouTubers before because telling a guy like, oh, you got to get to day seven or day 20 or day 90, you'll start levity. And I think it's total BS. <laughs> and I, I think it's like so, um, so cold hearted. Because the analogy I gave is imagine telling like an obese guy who's, really, you know, he's, he's heard about the negative effects of being obese and imagine telling him, okay, go to the gym for seven days and, you know, do this 20 days, he will do this 30 days, he will do this. And if you miss a day, you lose all those benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, well, that's not true at all. Like the guy yeah. who, who faps every single day, once, twice a day, and he goes two, three days without it. And he relapse, he should feel like a success because of that progress that he made, not like a failure. And I, personally, I, I think the idea of like watching NoFap videos and I think the, the NoFap benefits timeline, I think it just makes these guys like way more obsessed over it and it creates more of a negative impact in them. Mm. Right, and just think about it, man. Like imagine you have someone telling you um, at day 20, you're going to feel this, at day 40, this, um, 90 days, this. And then imagine you getting to that and you don't feel mm. it. 
well, then you're going to think, ah, oh, it's not working. I might as well not do this. I might as well just go and uh, continue what I was doing before. It's like, no, bro. Like, everyone is different. You might, it, you might not experience that at all. Or it just might take you longer, you know? Like, your healing is always going to look different than another person's healing. So I agree with 100%. that wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. GS asks, is this live or recorded? Oh, this is pre-recorded, bro. We had this back in time, and we found a way to, like, put your co- comment, you know, in real time. I don't know how we did that. All right. Brother Rashad asks, apart from subscribers and viewers, this is to Hamza, what moment or sign indicated that you... Uh, to you that you were gonna make it as a full time YouTuber. Also, Hamza unfiltered over Hamza. You, I've been saying that. <laughs> One moment indicated that I was gonna make it full time as a YouTuber. Bro, I was I was about fourteen years old. <laughs> I was posting videos about um Minecraft, RuneScape, and I remember I got partnered with this like media company called TGN. It, this was I, I think even before like YouTube AdSense or something like that, or maybe they had like lower um. Uh, requirements and so imagine being 14 15 years old in high school and you literally start getting paid 50 pounds 100 pounds a month for your cringy little minecraft videos Mm -hmm. and from that moment there was no career no job for me whatsoever i went through high school college and even university without ever once even considering like the jobs that i could get it literally was not in my mind it was always going to be a youtuber oh that's what's up see i struggle personally man i struggle because like you know how you said you didn't expect for the channel to like blow up yeah well now you have this big audience and it's like you know you you hardly even take the time to change what you're wearing before the next video (laughs) right so it's like sometimes it's like when you really start to think like man i have all these people like imagine being in front of two hundred thousand three hundred thousand people and it's like what you're saying holds so much power and so much value and so much repercussion right like you could be literally you could say something that could really put someone through a lot of pain and suffering and like you would have no idea right so like sometimes i struggle to make more content because like i'm like damn like i I don't want to like overstep my boundaries and at the same time like i realize that i don't know everything so sometimes i'm like damn like I really don't know what I'm talking about here. So should I even talk about this? And then it's like, bro, one week passes, two week passes, three week passes. So it's, just, it's tough, man. But I feel you on like YouTube being like you know, that thing for you. What was your moment? Well, when I realized that I, I could do YouTube full time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be honest, man. It was actually before I even started YouTube. Um, I was watching YouTube videos and I remember running across Elliot Hulse's videos and I was like, yo, this guy's the man, bro. Like, I love his videos. It's like always so much value back in the day. Like still, you know, he still gets value, but like the old Elliot, like yo, Elliot. And then you got the the musical come on, bro. Like there was (laughs) nothing like that, man. (laughs) <laughs> and then I seen that and I was like, yo, like this is so crazy. And then uh, around that same time is when I started having issues with uh, the girl that I was with. And then I realized I actually had an addiction to pornography. And then I started looking up on YouTube because like, like a degenerate. The first place I'm going to go to is YouTube. And um, I start finding other people who had the same problem. And then I started seeing like people are actually posting videos about this. I'm like, yo, like people are posting videos about this and I'm seeing people like living full time off YouTube. I was like, what if just maybe I could share my experience, not only help people, but actually make a living to where I could travel. I could do whatever I want and not have to work at like some, you know, physical location or something like, or for mm-hmm. someone else. Mm-hmm. And then from there, like, it's just like, it, it was a long way coming, you know, long time coming, but it happened, bro. Alhamdulillah. Thank Alhamdulillah, God. Alhamdulillah, bro. All right, we got about 16 minutes left, so we're just going to try to blast through it. Uh, Aman writes, I left Islam in 2019 after contemplating it throughout my teenage years, only to revert back in 2021. Alhamdulillah, what advice would you give somebody actively trying to follow Islam other than just the five pillars? Anhal, bro, anything? Ooh, so this is a big one. 
uh, your connection to God. And the way that I would classify this is you really have to sit back and like reflect on your life as like what's bringing you away from God. Because in the Quran, God says that he's closer to us in our jugular vein. That's pretty damn close if you think about it. So if if God never moves, if God's always this close to us, if you feel far away from God, will realize that he's not the one that moved you are and that's when you got to reflect okay what what am i doing that's pulling me away from god like maybe you're spending too much time on electronics maybe you are um i don't know maybe you're actually doing substances like you're doing drugs or something like that maybe you're just not reading the book itself you know there's so many variables that could come into play here but really figuring that out and then starting to cut those things out and understand that when you cut something out, you have to include something in. You you can't remove something without replacing it. You always have to replace mm -hmm. it. If not, your, your body is going to be like, yo, like what the hell is going on? So if you're removing these things, then you replace it with something that's going to bring you closer to the creator. Mm -hmm. So that could be spending more time in nature that could be not only doing the obligatory prayer, but then doing the sunnah prayer, the prayer that's recommended, right? And then on top of that, you know, making dua, doing dhikr. Um, there's so many things, but it's like you, you have to replace the things that you are removing. And that will ultimately bring you closer to the creator. And then you having this relationship with the creator, it puts you in a state of high iman. Hmm. Um, Fayed, if you want to <clears throat> explain what that is real quick. Iman, a lot of people have an, a misconception that Iman means faith, right? But in Islam, we don't just have blind faith. Iman is, linguistically, means acceptance of a fact, bro. And it's Iman is just the relative submission you've you've had to, like, fully consolidate Islam as, like, the truth. That's the only way I could put it. So Iman is, like, the confidence or the surety. But it's not even, like, a mental thing. It's more like a feeling. Exactly. And with Iman, you go through states like high Iman, low Iman. And the closer you are to the creator, the higher this Iman is. And I mean, you wouldn't really have a problem with Islam or your deen or anything like that at that point. Mm -hmm. All right, bro. Proper. Rashid writes, God is always there and loves us and loves those who do their best. Let's get back to John 100%. Rashid writes, love you, brothers. Yeah, yeah, right. Just arrived, but great to see Hamza on this conversation. 100%. Um, okay, so Zuhaib, you wrote this question and you wrote this other question. So just for the sake of time, just DM us on Instagram at the three Muslims, one word. And Rami, who handles all the, you know, DM inquiries and, you know, guidance and advice and all that, he'll hook you up, inshallah. Okay. Ash Ashraf writes... Where do you guys study the religion? Again, same thing. Just DM us on Instagram the same way you just typed it right there. Dog, okay, no I sir. realized yeah. I, I put my last name. Like, I realized I just cucked myself by putting my last name. It's okay. I put my full name on here, bro. It's, bro, people already know your full name. Yeah, you're right. That's that's all good, bro. No surf rights. If you're spinning plates, someone else has to do the dishes for it. Oh, that's deep, bro. That's deep. Man, I love about it, bro. All right. Mar writes, Hamza, this is a stick or twist moments. Ah, if you know first, man, you know. Twist and the afterlife is where you cash out. Shout out to Chris Fanny for watching. 100%. 100%. Rayan writes, I was born a Muslim and I still consider myself a Muslim. Just got a little distracted after moving to the West. How do I get back to Dean again? Again, just DM us on Instagram, the three Muslims, one word, and we'll hook you up, inshallah. Links in the description to all of that. But let's see if there's any more. Yeah, that should be it. All right, Hamza. It's been a pleasure, man. It really has. We finally got to have this stream, and I look forward to more streams with you, you know? And we can talk about a lot of different stuff, bro, that the brothers really do need help with, bro, like money, entrepreneurship, fitness diet i watched some of your fitness videos bro and diet videos and i could really see like you're not trying to give cookie cutter mainstream advice you know saying how hollywood and the mainstream modern fitness industry all the misconceptions all the bs that they're spewing out it's good stuff bro so anyone that is from our channel 
and you know they want to get more of you bro where can they head out to uh just search hamza on youtube i'm the top result now <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, bro. Total flex. i love being able to say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, bro. That's it. You don't have to say Hamza what? Nah, just just search Hamza, bro. That's Hamza. it. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Yeah, Last hey, I me. bet you everyone's gonna read that and say my name in like the most whitest name possible. Why don't you Why don't you tell them how to pronounce it in? Uh, in my Geneva, name, bro. yeah, my name is pronounced Angel Malti. Why don't you say your full name, bro? Nah, your full government worry, name. Bro. I mean, at this point, you might as no, well. No, my it. my full government name is Angel Malti, mm. but like my family name is Miguel Angel Malti Cueva. Mm. There we go. Yeah, but they don't gotta know that, you know. You giving these sisters fitna, bro, with the way you you know your native tongue, bro. We're gonna Hamza. stop that now. Yo, so Hamza, bro, the uh, unfiltered stuff. It's the good stuff, bro. Mm. Yeah, Thank that's you. That's good stuff. It feels better, some doesn't it? videos coming up. <laughs> yeah, but it feels better, doesn't it? Just like actually speaking and then not trying to make it entertaining. You're just, you're being real, you know? Mm. Bro, that's the beauty of YouTube when you literally just stick the camera on, no script, no nothing, just whatever's on your mind and people actually want to listen to you talk. I love yeah. it, sir. Yes, sir. That's facts, bro. It it reminded me of like times of my life. And bro, financially, in as an entrepreneur, bro, and I know the same with you, bro. We're nowhere where we want to be by any means. But one thing that, you know, one wisdom that I can share is when you stop relying too much on the money and you're too obsessed with the money, it's like you lose that detachment from the money. It doesn't define you. You talk about this in your unfiltered videos about just making enough and then you don't need the money. You don't rely on the money. The only thing we should rely on is Allah. But it's like when you don't need that money, Allah can finally trust you with more. And then you mm. get more barakah. You know what I mean? And I found that to be true like nine times out of nine. But you need the money. Then you make decisions based on the money. You do things compromising your integrity, your manhood. And it's like you do that with women. You do that with money, the dunya. You're not going to get those things, bro. But if you detach from the dunya, Allah is going to bless you with more. Mm, totally agree with that. I've got a video talking about that soon, actually. But um, when you don't need money is when you'll make the most. And of course, it's biased because you don't need it because you're probably making a good amount already and it all scales up. But that's when you get to make those truly long-term beneficial decisions instead of what's just quickly going to make you the most this week or this month. That's facts. Mm -hmm. That's facts. You think differently, too. You know, you, you think... Um, just how you said, but it's like... I don't even know how to explain it, man. Like, your thinking is more creative than it's just, it produces better results, better content. Thank mm. you. What, what do you mean, thank you for? For saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. I was good. <laughs> bro, I think we should, uh, we should end it here, man. It's been, we should end it here, bro. It's been great. We should follow the advice of uh, Hamza on making YouTube videos, bro. Don't don't add that filler stuff that that's gonna lower the the engagement, bro. Just know when to end it. Everyone's clicked off now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So with that being said, Hamza, bro, it has been has been amazing you having you on. You know, God willing, we will speak again. God willing, bro, you you tried the dry fasting and. I'm excited to see, you know, what comes to you during your reflections. And with that being said, for everyone watching, thank you for tuning in. Um, Rami already said his uh, dua, so I'm not going to say anything else on that. Regard Smash that like button, bro. Smash that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Head over to Hamza's channel. Show him some love, too. And with that being said, salamu alaikum. Thank you for having me on, boys. Take care, everyone. Adios, bro.